Now it's my pleasure to introduce your first presenter today, Dick Orlando. Dick is president and CMO of LeveragePoint. Previously, he served as EVP sales and marketing at Bizcom. He has held multiple senior leadership positions at companies such as SASTEC International, Datamatics, CMGI, Data General, and Wang Laboratories. His primary areas of expertise are in sales and marketing, operations, and Web 2.0 implementations to drive new business. Mr. Orlando has a BA in business management from Northeastern University. So with that, Dick, welcome. Thank you, Taylor. This is uh, really exciting, and thank you for joining our webinar at the tail end of the calendar year, which is usually the busiest time for, for a lot of us. I was really excited when Taylor asked me to do this, and until so she started giving me more details of it. She said, Dick, I'd like you to talk about the baby boomer era and the things that you did well and maybe the things you didn't do as well. And I said, I'm excited. Since 1946, when the first baby boomer was born, boy, is, does I have 40, 50 years of uh, content I could show you. And she said, oh, by the way, you only have 12 minutes. So I'm going to run through this as quickly as I can and pass it over to Taylor. But the transition theme, I think, is, is rather important. And one of the best quotes that I've heard uh, recently is from Jeff Bezos. And, and that's the theme of this webinar. It's about embracing powerful trends quickly. Uh, I remember way back when, when people were saying, there's no way I'll put my credit card information on the web and shop and have it delivered to me by FedEx. And you, you know what's happening this Christmas season uh, and holiday season. Um, but, but the truth is that the people who have fought the technology trends really didn't survive. And, and you really want to embrace the right technology trends uh, in your business as it does create a, a tailwind for us. And the baby boomers, and I could have picked 30, 40, 50 pictures to put up here, but from a technology perspective, uh, we were disruptors. So we are disruptors of the status quo. And from Bill Gates, who at, at Microsoft went from single-handedly, I think, killing the mini computer market that I was part of by putting software on a, on, a, on a small device uh, that really did everything that we were doing on mainframes before. And now, as you know, Microsoft is really in the, in the cloud space. Uh, Steve Jobs, just a real genius that said, hey, we need to change people's lives on how they use technology. We make it, need to make it easy to use. And you fast forward to today, and, and I had uh, a holiday party with my grandchildren, and all of them have iPhones. And they're teaching me how to use the iPhone, and, and mobile was, it was a big, uh, player there. So smartphones are really becoming a, a leader. Uh, I'm sorry, a way we do business here. Uh, Jim Clark, who's not well known, uh, was the first to take 3D graphics and CAD CAM and take it off the, the mainframe and put it on a desktop. But he's most he's best known for being the founder, co-founder with the young Mark Andreessen of Netscape, a, a browser that allowed us to use that uh, technology and access information. And Steve Case on the, on the lower left-hand side, was the founder of AOL. Now, I don't need to tell you the impact that AOL had on people's lives and getting all content on one, uh, one page, news, weather, sports, and develop into a social, a social site. Mike Benioff is, is just terrific. He, he really said, why do you need premise-based software? Uh, you can do it in the cloud. And he, and he picked on CRM, which is the heart and soul of every sales organization. And, Today, that Mark Benioff has is, is developed the Salesforce.com into the, the, the world's leading platform for uh, sales, marketing, service people, and, and, and applications now for the B2B space. And of course, Jeff Bezos, who disrupted the whole shopping experience from food to, to retail, but also he disrupted the, the how you store data. You, you don't need to store data in these huge data centers anymore uh, as, as much as you did before. You can put it in the cloud at a significantly reduced cost and, and, and higher levels of security. And you take um, another baby boomer who had to embrace certain technologies and execute change. Uh, and really that all of my career as a sales rep, uh, as a first line sales manager, VP of sales, uh, in charge of marketing, um, all the way to my, uh, my hair list days of, of CMO, COO, um, and, and uh, CMO uh, to center around how do you get this technology to create demands, uh, help the sales organization sell more, uh, and also make sure it's, it's profitable. And I've been in the B2B enterprise space my whole life. 
you can see the technologies in the middle here. We've gone from from the from the madman Don Draper um, Kodak projector to whiteboarding to uh, uh, Microsoft. And Microsoft came out with PowerPoint Excel that really saved not only a lot of salespeople's lives from lugging equipment around, uh, but also I think customer at customer meetings it's a lot more um, uh, it's a lot better uh, certainly with with this technology, especially when it's on laptops and and it's and it's mobile, but it's, it's two things that really pop out at me that when I when I talk about the the good old days and I'm not sure that there was, it was everything was good about the old days, but they needed me to go out there and people like me to educate buyers. Uh, access information what vendors had was pretty much only in print, and and. I had to go out and my sales teams had to go out, my marketing teams had to create content for us to present using these various technologies to uneducated buyers. Uh, and 90% and of the time it was on site. Well, te technology now, fast forward, is you have a, a bunch of inside and, and field sales teams that engage with educated buyers. You know, we did it to ourselves. We, we created a lot of content that people could access 7x24, not only on our websites, but competitive websites with analysts and a whole bunch of other ways. So we're dealing with a much more educated buyer. And there's two sort of, it's kind of a dichotomy here that the World Wide Web and the internet as we know it today with all of its apps uh, certainly has educated the buyer, but we're sending sales teams out with 30 year old technology. With technology, the PowerPoint has certainly made progress and Excel has certainly made progress and they try to automate as much as possible. But it's still this one-to-many presentation uh, tool that, that customers today um, are not in the same situation and the same knowledge level as they were back in the, quote, good old days. And what hasn't changed is the sales process, though, over the last 30, 40 years. Marketing still creates a lot of leads. They pass it into the sales organization who follows, follows hopefully all of those leads up. There's a customer meeting that takes place and there's a qualified pipeline or a forecasted, uh, forecasted pipeline of deals. And if you notice on the, on the third picture to the left, the, pr the person is presenting on, a, on an easel or, or, or a whiteboard. And where the changes are, are, are taking place here is the person now has changed to a more of a, of a PowerPoint type presentation. And maybe the person on the left there on sales follow-up is an inside sales rep. And maybe the marketing automation, marketing people are using marketing automation. But the rest of this pretty much stays the same. And after those meetings, which are very, very critical, uh, again, the creating qualified opportunities that enter the sales process. And then SBI comes out with this study that says, hey, you have to understand that six out of 10 of your forecasted deals do nothing. Your sales reps do not, or your sales teams do not convince the customer that the way they're doing it now is better than the way that you want us to disrupt the, the, the current process, all right? And it's, it's sad because 60% of the deals are lost to no decision or status quo versus all the other competitors com combined, and that's what the other 40%. And Forrester has a sort of an answer to this. It says, hey, the way, you can start, the way you can help this is by understanding that the first vendor who communicates a vision of value, if I change the way I'm doing business today, what value, which usually means financial value, do we get? And the first vendor that does that wins the business 74% of the time. And with much more educated buyers, the time you have to sell the people is certainly less than it was when they needed me for 100% of the information. Let's look at it from a numbers perspective. And this is as simple as you can get it. And for the mathematicians in the, in the audience, I'm, I'm using some poetic license here. But, but the bottom line is, is true. If you move, if marketing creates enough leads from trade shows, from content, from marketing automation, whatever, and there's 5,000 forecasted SQLs that end up in the, in, in the sales pipeline, and they're selling a, a solution that's 200, worth $200,000, the average sales value. And you know, best of breed, close rates are 30%, average is 20%, so say it's a 20% close rate. So basically, to make the $200 million that's assigned to you, and this could be a product launch, it could be a, a strategic product in the company, 
or it could be the company number. And this 200 million could just as well be easily 20 million or 2 billion. The math still holds. That you need to r roughly close a thousand deals. Now, if you can take that 60% and reduce it to 50%, or an additional 500 deals that'll end up in a decision because you did communicate a vision, and let's say of the 500, you close 20% of those deals, the revenue jumps to $220 million, or 22 million, or two point, or certainly a lot bigger if you were, if you were $2 billion, and the close rate jumps up a small 2%. The numbers look small, but the impact and, and the positive impact and sales VPs or drives sales VPs crazy is when deals are forecasted and 60% of them end up in no decision. Take a small percentage of that and you turn them into um, qualified opportunities and you close 10% of those, there it is. Do You can do it, certainly do it with, with your own numbers. Recently came back from, a, from CEB, Customer Executive Board, now gotten to purchase them, and they're the leaders in um, trends for sales and marketing, and there was over 1,500 sales and marketing leaders there. And the three themes that I got out of it was, one, digital. Digital is mainstream right now. Uh, digital transformation is being written from everybody with McKenzie and Forrester uh, down to the you know, to vendors like ourselves. But, but CEB said, hey, look, it's fact, it's here to stay, it's inescapable. 90% of B2B buyers use digital channels in the early, middle, and late stages of their buying journey. So coming to them with static content and static PowerPoint certainly puts certain, uh, in certain sales situations at a, at a disadvantage. It's a moving target. If you remember my slide, which said they needed me for 100% of the information before, well, now, the prospect spends a vast majority of their time on multiple avenues, to, uh, digital avenues, to get information, whether it be my site, whether it be social sites, analyst sites, and only 17% of the buyer's journey now is spent talking to sellers or communicating with sellers. And remember, we're competing with other sellers. Back to the Forrester point. If you, get, if you can create the vision for success, you can get in early, and, and you'll get a majority of that 17% of of time. And just because marketing created a lead using digital technology and you re you're able to receive that first meeting based on digital means of an inside sales rep, it doesn't end there. Uh, it says you must arm your reps with digital tools that guide their in-person conversations with clients, a prospective clients, to establish your credibility and speak directly to their pain points or their business points, or as I like to say it, um, what financial gains, top line, bottom line, are you going to create if I use your solution? Very different sales call than I made back in the 70s and 80s. You've seen, a lot of people have seen this before. This is a great study that every one of, uh, of, of us vendors use when we're trying to sell our, our increase in productivity solutions. And it's usually presented in what's wrong with today's sales meetings. And this is a survey where customer, uh, executives were asked, are vendor salespeople prepared for your meetings in the following ways? And they're saying, yes, 60% of the time or so they're prepared they're, because they're trained. They're trained on knowing their company, knowing the industry. But they really miss the mark on being specific on where they can help and where they can uh, share with me some some typical or example case studies of people in our industry. I like to look at it the other way around. Farsa did us a favor here. I look at this as the training that's taking place today is primarily talking about your company products, the features and benefits in the company. This is wrong. The, the positive thing and the framework that, that if that that's only wrong, so you need to know your products, but you need to go one step further and, and for us, has given us the framework here. We assume your reps will be prepared, that they'll understand the business, they understand the customer. But if you're sending your sales reps today into early sales meetings where the vision is created and where qualified opportunities are created, without letting them know specifically the two or three things that you do for customers to help them and give specific examples, they could be typical or you don't need to identify, obviously, their competition here, but show them information early on in the sales process. 
there's an 80% chance that that meeting will fail. What hasn't changed also over the, over the years is the point, the really important point and your communication is done by field or inside salespeople and sales teams uh, with, with clients. It's called the moment of truth time. And early sales presentations now become even more important to deliver the right content at the right time to the right audience. Picture a sales rep who gets a terrific lead from an insight says that we want to have a meeting next Tuesday it, it, for, for an hour and what the sales rep has to go through. They have to pick the right content to present to these people. Now, I, I know some of you out there have content repositories and I think they're great. Uh, however, none of the, these content repositories give you exactly what you should be showing. They give you the top three videos, the top two case studies, or the top three PowerPoints that you should be showing. So the sales rep ends up deferring to a corporate overview, thinking they can get a second meeting. Well, the rep doesn't have time to package this into a one hour presentation, doesn't have time to do this. Um, so today, the, the, the companies that are successful are providing sales ready content. And I know what, what everyone's thinking out there, well, it's not as easy as, as you say, it, it depends. Well, it is as easy as I say, and it's a requirement now. That's, that's the challenge that we have with salespeople today, and Taylor will get into this a little bit more. And it isn't because the sales reps and patients, it's because of the customer's need for, for the salespeople to deal with the relevant issues early on in the sales presentation. And this is still a sad case. This is the baby boomer created problem that we required so much other things from, from, from a week of training to, uh, to, um, to administrative tasks, to hunting for content. But 60%, close 60% of a sales rep's time is not spent selling. That's three days a week. Think about it. If you could save 20% of that time, if you, if you could only make it only two days a week that, you, that sales reps are spent doing other activities, your sales reps will, your sales will increase 15 to 20% without adding an additional headcount. We, we did do some really great things from, from uh, Gates to, uh, to, to, to Jeff Bezos um, and, and the Dick Orlandos of the world who have been fortunate enough to work with great companies, with great teams of people have done some good things. Uh, one of the biggest things we've done is create a lots of content. But there's some high habits right now, some traditional habits that are dying in today's customer-centric organization. And it's only the people that take advantage of those that I think will be successful moving forward. The detailed about us content, which usually took the first 10 or 15 minutes of a presentation, now is a two minute introduction. The static PowerPoint Excel presentations, the 30 plus uh, slides, the sales teams that re really say, I know why you're here, you've done your research. What I'd like to do is talk to you about what we do for our customers to make them successful. That's a very impactful way to start five minutes into the presentation. And we were trained to talk about features and benefits and put up customer logos showing how successful we are. Well, you know something? All the customer cares about is what's your value proposition? And, there's, and with content that's on the web today, primarily in the case studies, you can show customers, these teams are showing customers what the typical or example customer value propositions are for our most successful customers in your industry and which financial benefits are they getting. Pretty powerful stuff versus just talking about features and benefits. And, th and this is probably the one that, that I stopped doing a long time ago, but it's asking these 20 scripted data questions so, so our company, Mr. Customer, can better size your, the opportunity and, and come back later in second and third meetings to show you an example. You don't need to be doing this anymore. Customers don't like to give personal and financial information and, it's, and secure information out to vendors before they've decided if you wanna, if it's a qualified opportunity. So today's content needs to be flexible so you can revise the data on the spot with these value propositions. And I had a customer say, Dick, great value proposition and everything, but our data is different. Oh, great, where is it different? Well, it's different here. Well, I should be able to revise that data right on the spot, have a calculator functionality there, and I can show them some, I can create a vision how your success can be very similar to success of somebody else in your industry. And the other way, by the way, is I'm getting the customer data because they're volunteering it. I'm not asking for it. 
and we all come up with these great financial claims of ROI and TCO, and it's important, and I understand that. But the customer who now just gave me some data, saw a customer, an example, gave me some of their revised data. They may have double the office, the offices that the other customer had, or double the, the headcount, or half the headcount. Right there, right on the spot, right in the presentation, they can visualize the financial results that were created using this new customer volunteer data. Very powerful. And by the way, they will start, if you notice, I had the customer talking probably, I say, if, you, if customers are talking eight to 10 minutes into the sales presentation, you're not resonating with them. The, the, the presentation on the right will get customers speaking five minutes to 10 minutes in the sales presentation. That's, that's a huge benefit. And last but not least, we always get excited when the customer asks, um, can, you leave your, can you leave your presentation with us? I like to share it internally. And most people say, that's really great. It, 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 I'm glad they asked. Well, you know something, they're being polite. The second thing is my type A personality. I don't want my customer presenting, my prospect presenting my presentation without being trained on how to give it. So what I'm able to do now is take this example value proposition with the revised data and with the revised financial results and leave a PDF copy with the customer using the new customer data and results from internal sharing. I can do all of this in one meeting. Now for the sales VPs in the room and the product line managers in the room, what type of presentation would you rather have your sales rep go out on a highly qualified first meeting? The second thing I, I have you visualize is what happens if, the, if a C-level or, or a senior executive walks into the meeting and says, I only have 15 minutes I'd like to, can you please get to the bottom line and let me know what's, you know, why, why I should be looking at your solution. The presentation on the right does it, the presentation on the left misses every single time. Three ideas. One, do something. No matter who's, so there's, there's 5,000 sales enablement solutions out there. Customers are empowered now. The sales reps need to be empowered, sales teams with insight-based, value-selling sales presentation tools that drive Increase pipeline and reduce note decisions. Create that vision up front, lower those decisions up front or any time during the, the, the sales cycle. And don't wait for your competition to force your hand. Start simple. Everybody, everybody talk about adoption, right? Well, sales reps adopt it and we have three, three or four generations of sales reps out there. Sales reps always gravitate to their comfort zone. So the sales tools need to leverage current content. content. Sales reps know how to talk to a case study, but they're being forced to drag and drop the case study and send it to a customer's busy, busy email inbox. Not successful. So we need to target some early success stories and adoption will go viral. Third, test it. Take a small group, don't roll it out the entire sales force because the millennials will represent more than 50% of your sales force in, in a few years. But we have a lot of digitally savvy, digitally quotient sales and pre-sales professionals that are already using digital tools. And training for this group is minimal and adoption will be fast. They already understand the, the, the case study. They already understand the benefits. They understand digital. This is a very simple transition for these people. And today we'll talk a little bit more about this later. It's also from a, from a you wanna recruit the best and the brightest millennials into your sales teams. They won't come on to your sales teams unless you have digital tools, and you certainly won't retain them if you don't. The last two slides, there's a lot of, that's Baby Boomers that a great job at creating content, and great job at storing content. But it was written in a way where we expected people to download it and read it. Those days are gone right now, and you can see the various levels of, of uh, content up here that now are into repositories, but sales reps are still spending a lot of time putting it together. You need to put this in a sales-ready content presentation for today's sales teams to win those first meetings. Case studies are the way to go. It, it, case studies are the gold. Mine the gold from the case studies. It tells the before and after story. It, it provides some business drivers. It provides some information. And you can do it in a digital way, which I promise you, your, your early sales meetings will be more successful, more qualified opportunities go on the pipeline, and you'll reduce the number of no decisions and status quo decisions in your sales organization to drive anywhere from 15 to 25% increased success. For that, with that, I'd like to turn it over to my millennial partner, Taylor, to have you walk through how you do this. 
Great. Thanks, Dick. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm the director of marketing here at Leverage Point. I've started my postgrad career here about three years ago as our marketing program manager. And prior to that, I studied information design, corporate communications, and marketing at Bentley University, where I was president of the Bentley Marketing Association. And I want to start off my section today with a quote from one of the greats, Mark Zuckerberg. He states, in a world that's changing really quickly, the only strategy that is guaranteed to fail is not taking risks. I interpret those risks as change. The only strategy that is guaranteed to fail is sticking with the status quo, which is exactly what I'm here to talk about today. So we, uh, they unleashed me in Las Vegas uh, last October uh, to attend the, and sponsor the CEB, now Gartner Sales and Marketing Summit. And Dick mentioned our findings earlier in his presentation, but I'd like to reiterate them here. To say that digital transformation was the theme of the conference is a complete understatement. The digital age is here, and it's not going anywhere. Brent Adamson, Principal Executive Advisor at CEB, says that it's an inescapable evolution. 94% of B2B buyers use digital channels in their buying journey. This promotes a tough buying environment for sellers, bigger buying groups, overwhelmed buyers, good enough buying, and stalled deals. Empowered buyers are becoming overwhelmed buyers with too much information, too many stakeholders, leading to stalled deals or no decision at all. An evolving response to this tough environment is marketing and sales investments in digital capabilities. B2B buying is a moving target. Your prospects are engaging with you through multiple channels simultaneously. 27% of the overall buying journey is spent researching independently online. Digital marketing is key here. 22% is spent meeting with internal buying group discussing that research. Now, the buyer is 49% of the way through, and they still haven't spoken to your salespeople. 18% of the overall buying journey is spent, with, oh, is spent researching independently offline. 16% is spent doing other, and, and God only knows what that is. Uh, that leaves just 17% of the overall buying journey to spend meeting with potential sellers. But remember, you're not the only seller. This doesn't mean that the role of a sales rep is obsolete by any means. It's more important than ever. That slice of the 17% that you do get needs to be customer focused, value driven, and of course, digital. Which brings me to my final takeaway. Just because in-person begins doesn't mean digital ends. Brent said th that this is the one thing we should take away from the conference. It's vital to arm your reps with digital tools that guide their in-person conversations, establish credibility, and speak directly to customer pain points. So obviously, the digital transformation is underway. But why now? Why the sudden urgency? Ah, yes, that's why I'm here. We've all heard it before, sounding oddly familiar to the midnight ride of Paul Revere. The millennials are coming. The millennials are coming. It was true, we were coming, but now we're here. In 2015, millennials surpassed Generation X to become the largest share of the American workforce. In 2016, millennials surpassed baby boomers as the nation's largest living generation at over 75 million people. The Arteca Group conducted an online survey with B2B managers and executives that showed millennials had the highest percentage of decision makers who reported they had budget and or final sign-off authority in technology purchases or contracts worth $10,000 or more. Millennials are becoming our organization's leaders and our buyers. Our generation continues to grow and is projected to make up 50% of the workforce by 2020. But who are millennials? Well, we get a pretty bad rap. We've been labeled sensitive snowflakes that are entitled, whiny, unmotivated, greedy, narcissistic, and lazy. But for the good of our companies, we may want to try to look at, at this from a positive perspective. So rather than sensitive, I find us perceptive. Whiny? No, we're curious. Not entitled, educated. Cross off the un. We are totally motivated. We're just motivated differently. We're unstoppable when we know what we want. Not greedy. We're proud. Okay, maybe a little narcissistic, but mostly proud. We're not lazy. We just already completed the task that you thought would take us all day. And now we can watch Netflix, right? 
But most important of all, we are digital natives. So what else do you need to know about millennial B2B buyers and sellers in the workforce? Well, I've got four points for you. One, we require transparency. I was born in 92. Uh, I, I heard those eyes roll through the phone. Facebook was founded when I was 11. I've grown up along with the rest of my co cohort able to see and read the intimate details of people's lives in seconds. I did school projects on Google Docs, looking at the edits of my peers in real time when they weren't even in the same building. When I came into the workforce, I expected that same type of transparency between colleagues, departments, and the tools we use to help with our success. As a marketer, I'm in the middle. My job fits between the pricing and product teams and the sales team. The thought process from product to pricing to marketing to sales should be seamless. We should all be on the same page in regards to the value we're creating, capturing, and communicating to ensure our customers' success. Number two, we need you to get to the point, fast. According to my tech systems, 87% of millennials say that their smartphone never leaves their side, meaning that competition for millennials' attention is only a click, click away. CEB states buyers are now as much as 83% of the way through the sales process before actually engaging with the seller which leads me to fun fact number three. We don't want to waste your time, and we especially don't want to waste our time. Like I said, just a little narcissistic. But seriously, long sales PowerPoint presentations focused on about us, your product features and benefits lead millennials to think, if you're just going to reiterate the information that's on your website, why do you have a website at all? Then we scroll through Instagram, and uh, your deal is lost. Lastly, we expect technology, and we get frustrated when you don't use it. It's no secret that millennials are digitally savvy. We're always thinking about a new way, stronger, better, faster, to approach an old thing. Think Uber and Airbnb. Usually, through a quick Google search, we find out that our million-dollar idea is already taken. There's some 26-year-old in Silicon Valley with the domain name and patent pending. Shoot, back to the drawing board. But if, you're, if I'm your potential buyer or key recommender, and you email me a white paper, get me on the phone to present a PowerPoint to me, share a video as follow-up, schedule another meeting to show me a spreadsheet proving your value, et cetera, I'm sitting there thinking, this could all be done better. Why isn't this all in one place? Where the hell is their sales enablement tool? So for us, this whole transformation thing isn't even a thing. We were raised digital. My earliest years consisted of asking, is there an app for that? And I've since graduated, graduated too. Dude, what are you doing? There's about 500 apps for that. Trainers and researchers are catching on the millennials' approach to winning first meetings. The challenger sales states, the best reps to win the battle, not by discovering what customers already know they need, but by teaching them a new way of thinking altogether. Forrester Research concurs, stating that the first vendor to succeed in communicating a vision to value to executives wins the business 74% of the time. There is nothing that grinds the millennials' gears more than wasting time, which explains why we turn our nose up to the traditional sales approach. Cold calling, long presentations, and frequent rejection? Yeah, uh, we're all set. According to a study by InsideView, 90% of high-level executives don't respond to cold calls or email blasts. Millennials understand why. We hate being sold to. People are armed with so much information today about products and services that they're looking to buy or engage with. The, tra the traditional sales approach won't gain traction in the age of readily accessible information. So how are we changing the game? Well, we're accessing sales-ready content published by marketing. Having our content all in one place saves us a lot of time and keeps us focused on making sales and money. We're using technology. To millennials, this one's a given. Nowadays, there isn't a job that can't be made more efficient and effective with technology. Going into a sales meeting without it is old school, careless, and immediately putting your company and your revenue in jeopardy of being beat out by competition. Sales tools are abundant and give reps the confidence to articulate the value of their offering early in the sales process. Arming your reps with these tools saves time where you need it most and gives you the ability to spend more time working on qualified opportunities and closing deals. And of course, we're getting to the point. 
Rather than boring, informed buyers and traditional corporate overview, PowerPoint slides, highlighting features and benefits, millennial sales reps get straight to it. In today's customer-driven environment, selling is about sharing knowledge and current trends in the customer's industry. Customers want to learn from reps what's working for other customers in the industry and see new uh, ways that make it work for their company to positively impact revenue, cost, and profitability results. Millennials deliver a customer example to create collaboration early in the sales process, qualifying opportunities before those traditional sales reps. And finally, we're proving our worth. All sales reps make claims, and it's rare for them to go the extra mile and prove, not only qualitatively, but quantitatively, that those claims are legitimate. Millennials are accustomed to filtering through spam, false advertisements, and scams in their personal life. A millennial rep understands the importance of proof and trust when it comes to buying and selling. Not only do they get to the point, but they also prove the point, making it pretty easy for a B2B buyer to visualize what results can be delivered for their company. All right, so now you've heard me geek out about my generation, but where should you in your digital sales or where should you start in your digital sales transformation? Well, Dick said it once, and I'll say it again, case studies. Previous generations have set millennials up to succeed. They've generated a plethora of amazing content for our buyers that they actually want to read. But it's static, and it frequently gets lost in the shuffle. Case studies are gold. They very clearly give you a crisp background and challenge, spice it up with a quote, and then get straight into solutions and financial results. Buyers download it from your site. They ask for it after a sales call. They use it to make buying decisions based off the financial results that they see in those case studies. So why are salespeople only using them as a leave behind? Let's pause right there, leave behind. Why are we leaving behind something that gets to the point fast and proves your worth and convinces a buyer to buy? Oh, is it because case studies aren't digital? Well, now they can be. Embedding this information into your sales presentation is the only way to be the first vendor to communicate a vision to value. And remember, according to Forrester, that vendor wins the business 74% of the time. So let me show you a quick example in the Leverage Point platform about transforming this case study digitally. So this is literally a case study embedded into a sales presentation. It starts with a brief background, lets the, lets the buyer know their problem, and brings them into insights, or what case studies like to call them as challenges. You know, 11% of your IT budget is, is average spent on, on developing new applications. It really sets the stage for them and allows them to give the seller a little bit of pushback. Then we can go right into the summary. Where are we delivering value? This is the solution section of that case study. And it allows the buyer, it allows the seller to say, okay, we can deliver you value in these four areas. Which one do you like the most? Let's talk about it. Finally, we start to quantify those. And this is really where we change the game and where you can embed all of that case study information is when we start to quantify. And doing it in this digital format allows us to be interactive. We can take these typical results, we can take these results from another customer that we got out of a case study, and we can change them so that they're unique to the conversation with the prospect on the line. Maybe their number of applications is more like 100. You can go right in live on the phone with your, with your potential buyer and start creating something that's unique to them. As you go through the presentation, you can dip, dive down deeper into those four areas that we provide value, giving them more information and, and really having a conversation with them. And at the end, we end up summarizing the exact value that's gonna be delivered to them because these are their numbers. This is interactive. This is something that we just established using a conversation. And best of all, you're not wasting all that time looking for all the content that you need. It's right at the bottom. It's right attached to the presentation. You can go into a video, white paper, any supplemental content is readily available and sales ready, most important. So, I'll end with a warning to all of you that are still thinking about sticking with the status quo. You're committing three felonies here. One, 
you're denying that buyers are educated and more than 80% through the sales process before engaging with a rep. Two, you're ignoring the shift in demographics of buyers and sellers. And three, you're avoiding interactive, customer-specific presentations that engage buyers. I hope this morning flips the remainder of the skeptics, and that's all I have under my presenter hat for today, but I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen to this old snowflake. Um, I'm going to change gears now and put my moderator hat back on and let you guys know that if you found any of this interesting, we'd be happy to digitally transform one of your case studies free of cost. Just check the corresponding box in the exit survey upon leaving today's webinar. And don't forget, if you complete that survey, you'll get a copy of Dick's white paper, What Do You Do For Your Customers, and be entered into a raffle giving away one free copy of the Challenger sale. All right, on to Q&A. Uh, we've had some great questions come in already, and there's still time to enter your question into the panel on your screen. So please do so, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. All right, Dick, we've got some good ones. I will gladly field this first one myself. Yes, the webinar is recorded, and the slides and recording will be emailed to you within two business days. Okay, real first question. In your experience, how long does it take to create a digital value proposition? Okay, I'll take this one. We usually say three to five days to select a case study and work with you to create something that's ready to test for, for both of you. We'll go back and forth with you, embed all that material, embed all of your, um, your branding and, and messaging and, and get something that's ready to test in the field. And, and those field tests uh, can go anywhere, you know, from, from a month to a year. You know, it's really about testing it. And we like to say test it with 10 opportunities. Um, get it out there, see it, see the results, and then iterate from there. Um, and that's really the time that we're, we're expecting to, to make that digital value proposition. Okay, next question. Uh, what about training the salespeople? Dick? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a question, it's a question that we get all the time, certainly. And the, and the really great thing I like about the millennials now is they're coming to me already trained in, in the technology. They're coming to us digitally trained. So this approach of putting up all the information on one screen is very, very uh, comfortable to the millennials. And, and it also helps with reducing the amount of non-selling time. This 59% is probably the most bothering statistic that I've, that, that I've showed you here. It, with all this technology, we still continue to add on to that time versus reduce that time. We can train, it's usually over a, a webcast or whatever, uh, sales reps, sales teams that are sitting in their offices um, and take maybe an hour of their time walking them through a typical value proposition and they pick it up right away. So training now needs to be looked at in a totally different light in a digital mobile world than it is in the classroom, um, spend a week or two out of the field mode. Absolutely. Um, and I'm going to merge two questions here. Um, of a sales force made up of multiple generations, do you see any, do you see only millennials adopting this? Um, and, and I'm going to kind of merge that with, you know, how do you manage audiences of diverse composition? So baby boomers and millennials. Um, and really, you, to, to, and I'll, I'll field that question, Dick. Sorry, I'm already going into it. Um, really, it does require digitally savvy people to start. Um, so start with your millennials, start with people that are digital natives um, and, and really get them using the tool and integrate it into, into their everyday, um, everyday routine, right? Um, and, and they will see success. This is a digital transformation for a reason. Uh, digital is going to provide to provide more success and get you to get get your sales through quicker. Um, so seeing that success and using those success stories is really going to help the rest of your organization follow suit. Um, obviously, money is is <laughs> is a really great way to motivate salespeople. Uh, so if they see millennial salespeople closing deals, um, they're going they're going to want to follow suit and they're going to want to uh, do the same. But um, the most important thing is the tone is from the top. You know, if you can get your sales leader or even your C-suite on board in this digital transformation, you're going to find much more success 
um, in, in your sales uh, team as a whole. Um, really getting that sales leader buy-in and, and pushing this as, as not an option, but, but a requirement. I would say. Yeah, I, I have to jump in here and yeah. say say something. Um, forget the baby boomers. Um, we, we're we're a pretty stubborn group. Uh, we've come a long way, um, and I don't mean it in a negative way. That the baby boomers who are digitally savvy, the baby boomers who um, want to adopt this, will do it. You won't have to, you won't have to ask them. Uh, the baby boomers that are that are doing very well in the sales force, they have big accounts, they're they're doing well. Leave them alone. It, it, it's working. Let them use the PowerPoints. Let them use the spreadsheets. That's fine. This isn't about converting a stubborn old senior, excuse me, senior <laughs> uh, baby boomers. Uh, and I was born in 1949, so I can get away with it, I guess. Um, to, to 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 grab onto new technology. You know, it, it's more for what is your Salesforce going to look like over the next two to three years, and how are you best going to prepare that Salesforce to meet the challenges that the customer is throwing up to us. Right. Great. Uh, next one. This one's for you, Dick. Uh, are there other areas in the sales process where you can use digital presentations? Yeah, it, you know, there are. You know, the sales force is like uh, CEB said, Brent said, it's, it's the beginning, it's the middle, it's, it's the end. Uh, the nice thing about the digital technology today is it's capturing all of the information. So this is, ends up being a live document. Uh, I like to say that as you get into the heavy lifting of due diligence and, and, and areas like that, you're, you're capturing this information. So what is the customer doing with you by giving you the information, working with you? Is it creating a business case? So it's a live business case under, under, the, under the hood here. So when you get to the negotiation stage, you and the customer are agreeing on what the business case is and how much money, how much revenue it could put to the top line, reduce costs, mitigate risk, whatever it is, but the business case is made. So when you're going into the negotiation stage, your discounts will be, uh, it'll be diff very difficult for, for the negotiators to give, ask you for 20, 30% discounts, okay? And I'm not saying this eliminates discounts, but some of the best customers that we have say, you know, our average discount is being reduced by anywhere from five to eight percent on a base of maybe 20, 25, 30 percent. That is huge bottom line benefits. So yes, you can use it at the beginning, which to me is the most critical. Unless unless the customer lets you start the game, you can't finish it. Uh, but also in the middle to to handle, you know, you're putting the technical people, the technical people that can handle that. Um, it's a very powerful uh, system, a very powerful set of uh, logic uh, behind these, these uh, assumptions and these conclusions. And at the end, uh, when you put the business case in front of the negotiator, uh, you've certainly maintained control. Absolutely. Um, and I'll take this next one. What's the best way to get attention of millennials in a sales negotiation? Uh, and I really think the answer to that is, is you know proof you know get get to the point and show us the bottom line um we we are frequently uh filtering through spam and and false messaging um and promotions and everything and and what i would really want to see in a sales negotiation is is proof here is what we've seen from other customers here is the dollar amount we saved them and taking your numbers in uh, we're we're looking to save you this much and and make it so that it's not a question it's a it's a rule it's it's what's going to happen um, uh, I I think we're really motivated off of proof and and being um, and being you know simu simulated by 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 money and the, those numbers and 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 uh, you know helping my pain points really. yeah, I think I think that's very important the only the only one thing that I'd add is it's a pretty powerful statement when early on in the sales presentation, and certainly in the negotiation stage, when you can say, let me show you examples of customers in your industry that are having significant success using our solution. What, you know, what are you saying? You're saying, let me show you what your competition is doing. Okay? And this is a very, um, this is a tool where you don't have to show exact, you don't want to show customer names, you don't want to break security issues and you certainly don't want to show exact data from other customers but certainly 
the business challenges and the business drive is from customers in the same industry are relatively the same. Some may be more important than the others. And a nice thing about a digital presentation is if uh, saving electricity is not important to one customer, you just take it out. That's not their business case. Whereas maybe for, for another customer who has maybe 100 data center generators out there, uh, it's important to them, okay? So customers want to hear what, what their competition is doing while maintaining the, the secrecy and, and, the, and, the, um, and the security of, of information. Yeah, definitely. And I, I know we promised that we'd wrap up at 11.45, so we're just going to take one last question. Um, and Dick, I'm going to throw this one over to you. Um, how do you overcome sales representatives that are not willing to use digital tools? <laughs> You're talking to a, a baby boomer that, that's Italian. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, fine, make your numbers using your traditional way. That, that's great. I have no problem doing it. Like I said before, baby boomer is making the numbers and the customers are happy and you're a positive influence on the, on the company. That's fine. Uh, just let them do it. Um, if, they, if they really don't want to do it at all, then it's sort of like, let's, they're going to be replaced anyway. There's 10,000 of us a day retiring. Okay. So, but I, I don't think uh, any baby boomer out there would stand up and say, absolutely, I'm not going to use that because I think it's junk and they're not making their numbers. And if the sales VP it was probably going to be a millennial real soon is, um, is going to put up with that kind of behavior. Is that fair? Yeah, <laughs> no, I think that's fair. Um, yeah, I mean, if they're, if they can make their numbers without them, great. But I think this whole presentation has said that very soon they won't be, and they'll be beating, uh, being beat out by competition and, and they'll learn that soon enough, that's for sure. Um, okay, so so that's it from us for today. But before you go, uh, just to let you know that next month's webinar will be hosted by Mike Chase, uh, entitled Why You Need a Value-Based Strategy. And so if you'd like to register for that, you can do so on the exit survey. That'll pop up when you leave the webinar. Uh, but that is it from us for today. So thank you all for taking the time to join us. A special thank you to Dick for your insights. And from all of us here at LeveragePoint, happy holidays. Take care.